Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Above Bar Church, Southampton. Both a big warm welcome to all of you here in the building and, of course, to you online, out there, wherever you are in the world. Don't worry, not interactive. We can't see you. That's fine. Um, so, yes, um, here we are this morning. Our, our service today is a real focus on helping the poor, and that sounds quite kind of like a, a broad statement, but woven throughout the Bible is a real call, right from Genesis to Revelation, is a real call to um, serving, to a call to action to help those who are, who are in poverty. Um, and what I'd like to do is just to start with reading a psalm. If you could find in your Bibles on page 561. And whilst you're doing that, just to say, if you're new to the church, we would love to hear from you. Doesn't mean that you're committed in any way, but we would love to hear from you if you're new to the church. Sometimes there's cards in the Bible, but you can also go on the website. So we would love to hear from you if you're new to Above Bar Church. Thank you. So Psalm 34, if we can find it, because there's a bit of participation here. So page 561. So I'm going to read. So basically, I read all the odds and evens with you, and you read all the even ones right up to verse 8. And we read verse 8. So Psalm 34, 1 to 8. So every other verse you read with me. Does that make sense? Okay, so here we go. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. So I'm Kathy Gleason. I'm debt center manager for CAP here at Above Bar Church. You'll hear more about me and what we do um, here in Southampton later as we go through the service but the focus of our service is really about what we do as a church, but also individuals in terms of supporting and helping and reaching out to, to those who are in poverty. And let's not just think about that as material poverty. Amen. Thank you. I invite you to stand with us. We're going to start our service today by worshipping together.
Good morning, my name's Chris Webb. Uh, you can take a seat. Isaiah 40 says that they that wait on the Lord will renew their strength and they will mount up and rise on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow faint. Um, Kathy is leading our service for the first time, and so I thought it'd be good to find out something about her, about her background, um, and what she's doing. So, Kathy, tell us about your family. Your probably a very apt person to be leading this service. Tell us about your background, your family. Yeah, so um, first of all, they should have vetted me before asking me to lead the service. Anyway, um, sorry. No, um, so I'm youngest of eight children, um, born into a very Irish Catholic family. Um, and my mum and dad were very, I mean, every day they had to count the pennies, make sure that they could you know, afford the rent, make sure that we had food on the table. Well, not that we could sit around the table. There was too many of us. Um, so, yeah, so, and, and certainly I remember as a child, my dad talking about um, just growing up in Ireland and just clinging onto the back of a chair, kneeling up on, on a chair and, and just crying out with the pain of the hunger that he was experiencing. Um, and it was in a really, really difficult time in Ireland. I mean, throughout its history, it had a difficult time. But, you know, he grew up kind of knowing what it was like to be in such pain with the hunger. And we never grew up with that. Mm. We were always, you know, we always had what we needed. Um, may not have had what we wanted, but I have to say, I, because it was very humble, I always only wanted my sister's clothes, <laughs> and I couldn't wait until she was too big and she had to hand them down to me. I was like, oh, great, I can wear them. Ah, oh, Kathy, I'm trying to impersonate your accent as you're talking. <laughs> I think you, s you speak so smoothly. So obviously you're from, you're from Ireland, but you moved to Birkenhead <laughs> or somewhere like that. <laughs> and then... Um, oh, so funny. And then... <laughs> Do I sound like that? <laughs> <laughs> kind of. <laughs> That's hilarious. Go on. <laughs> so, after, after growing up in, in the Wirral, yeah. you did some youth work in London. Yes. Tell us about oh, that. my word. Yes. So, I qualified as a youth and community worker. And then, once all of that was done, I actually went to the east end of London, first of all, in um, South Canning Town Estate, if anybody knows that. And it is like the roughest. I mean, National Front was the big thing to be a part of. I mean, for those who don't know the National Front, it's now the British, whatever it's called now, I can't even remember what it's called, but very right wing, Briti BNP. the BNP, Ma National, British National Party. Um, and, you know, kids doing Ouija boards and all sorts of stuff and stairwells and drugs and everything. So, and then I went to the northwest of London to do youth work in a very different place, but as much need in some of the areas, and then came to Southampton, working in the Flower Roads, Mansbridge. I don't know if anybody knows those areas. Um, certainly in those days, they really had a, a bad reputation, especially for beating up and having big fights with students. Amazing. Because, of course, students were getting 10% discount in the shops, but people who were really struggling to get by each day didn't get those discounts. Mm. So there was a bit of tension. So in Southampton, you came, you came back to the Lord, and yes. you came to Above Bar in yeah. 2012, and, and now you're a CAP debt centre manager. What's that? Yeah, so, well, I ask myself that quite often, but no, I basically... Um, Above Bar Church, partner with CAP, Christians Against Poverty. And it started here in this church, I mean, it must be 10 years ago now, if not 11 years ago. And, um, and the centre reopened a year last February, so just over a year ago. And um, basically CAP was birthed and continues to 
uh, remain rooted in biblical gospel and combining that practical help with spiritual truth. Um, so we support people who are in debt. They could be anybody. Um, no background is, no, there's no prejudice in terms of the background that people find themselves in debt. So we literally just walk alongside them and help them come out of debt. Um, thankfully, don't have to be good at maths to do that because the people at head office do all of that. Um, where our role as a debt centre manager, I recruit volunteers, we go to visit clients, support the volunteers, support the clients, and do things like this as well. Brilliant. Yeah. So we'll hear more about that as the service progresses. Yeah. Um, and over, back to, over to Ed. We are going to do an all-age worship song now. So if you are a child who'd like to come down the front and do the actions, Ruth is going to come down and help us with them. And we're going to sing this song together. So I invite you to stand with us and let us sing again. church here this morning. 
every age and stage in this church worshipping together. And Lord, we thank you that that's what church looks like. Now, as we continue through our service, we're going to send our children and our young people off to their groups. So as we do that, we're going to have a couple of minutes of um, hubbub and noise. I'd encourage you to turn to the person around you and to have a conversation with them. We're Malcolm Beverly Knightley. Um, we attend the Above Bar Church East and have done for the last 14 months. Uh, prior to that, um, we uh, were uh, church leaders down in Devon for a number of years and relocated to Southampton uh, for our retirement. We had um, previous experience with CAP quite a few years ago, but things have changed since then and it's been absolutely brilliant to link up Again, with a CAP as an organisation who uh, we have a great respect for and enjoyed working with in the past. We're currently uh, befrienders for CAP and uh, really enjoy that. I find it um, very encouraging that we're able to speak about Jesus straight away. People expect us to speak about him and to be able to pray with our clients on our first visit is amazing. Um, in previously, we've uh, it, when we were church leaders, we were befrienders for CAP, and um, we actually ran a an alpha course for uh, our CAP clients. And as a result of that, we had three ladies came to faith in Christ, and um, one of them was my very first lady that I befriended, and. Um, still in touch with her and she's still walking with uh, with Jesus and it's amazing um, it's such a, a fantastic opportunity to be able to speak to people about our faith and why we do what we do uh, one of the ladies uh, sadly passed away but she passed away having come to the Lord so which was just amazing um, so uh, it was really uh, it's really been amazing um, so yeah we love doing it we we love being able to speak about our faith, why we do what we do, uh, that we have hope uh, for the future, no matter what we have to face. Um, so yeah, we, we just uh, really, really love it. I encourage you, if, uh, if you can, to be befriend us and uh, get involved with CAP um, because it really is amazing uh, to see so many people come to faith through this wonderful organisation. Hi, I'm Andrea and I became debt free through the help of Christians Against Poverty. I heard about CAP when my sister brought me to Buff Bar Church, Southampton. I was in a lot of arrears with my council tax, my water rates, I owed money to catalogues, etc, etc. And I felt really low, depressed, I just drank more and more alcohol and I started taking cannabis. I was hanging around with the wrong people, drinking, buying cannabis, getting into more debt. What made me more this way, I was brought up badly abused, and that was by two lots of parents I had. I moved to Lincolnshire with my son, to, soon to be husband, sorry, and my oldest daughter, Crystal, my son, who had Down syndrome, Jamie, and my baby girl, Sapphire. Sadly, I lost in a horrific car accident. I had stopped smoking for the health of my children and my husband also stopped smoking for the health of them. Sadly, my Jamie, Jampot, came down very poorly. I started smoking again, so did my husband. We got bad news, Jamie, my little Jampot, 
as leukemia than plastic. He was poorly for over three years in and out of Nottingham Queen's Hospital by Jamie, who was going through his recovery. I started to get in to know other parents. One of the other parents drank alcohol and I joked, I joined in. I had an awful life living in Lincolnshire and Sapphire. Once Sapphire and Jamie passed away, I moved back to Southampton and the drink and smoke and weed got more and more worse. Then I met White Dot, uh, Steve White sorry, from Kristen Against Poverty and they helped me. Cap set up a plan where I paid out a set amount each month and they paid those I owed money to. These people were writing letters and knocking on my door. I even had a bailiff come to my house and I was petrified as my children were teenagers and had all the modern cons. I was worried. I rang Cap and they were able to stop the bailiffs. One month I could not afford to pay into my plan so I called Cap. They said I could pay out of my savings. Oh, I didn't know I had any savings. That's good, I said. And they said this is what they budgeted for me. And this included it in my plan. I had enough to pay that month and enough money to get to start shopping. The help from Cap meant I learned how to budget, so I saved enough money when I became debt-free to go on holiday. I planned a book to... Uh, I planned a booked holiday to Greece last October, but sadly I couldn't go because I was very ill, ended up having to get a stoma put in as I had a hole in my stomach, in my bowels. I believed God saved me from my life before I was in debt, while I was in debt, and when I was very ill. I now, I now do not smoke cannabis anymore and I only have a drink socialising. I will be going on a holiday soon. <laughs> so just very quickly from me, thank you to Beverly and Malcolm Knightley, and especially to Andrea. She was so nervous doing that. So all three of them are in the house today, in the church, in God's house. So, and we have a table, if you haven't noticed, out in the lounge, if you want to come and chat with them. We'll be hanging around there. But just to say, to add to Andrea's story, that she has actually, we, we both just forgot, but she's actually given up smoking cannabis um, since becoming debt-free. And she's also helping out as a volunteer with CAP. So that's a real testimony um, to, to the work that CAP has done with her. Um, she was certainly a client before the centre reopened last February, but the journey has just taken so long. So I just want to thank them for their kind of courage to speak out, and as nervous as they may have been in doing that, the videos. Thank you. Chris, Ed? Uh, well, Ed's going to lead us in worship now, but um, as he does, we're going to take up an offering. Remember that the offering is an opportunity to worship um, as part of our discipleship. Um, so do give as you're able. Thank you. Such great testimonies there that we get to hear. And this is the work of Jesus. So let us now sing and worship Jesus for who he is. I'd like to stand with us.
So I think um, one of the things that the Lord has done uh, in Above Bar Church in the last 10 years, um, and especially in the last five years, is move the church towards the poor. Um, so it really is our work with, with CAP, uh, it really is our work in Harefield, a really poor area of the city that is growing, our work with asylum seekers. Um, and our big breakfast and our big difference. And one of the people that he's really moved um, to lean into the plight of the poor is, uh, is Sanjay. Um, so Sanjay, oh, I had a heart attack then because I, I couldn't see you. Um, <laughs> Going to just um, ask Sanjay a few questions. Um, so Sanjay, you're involved in the big breakfast, the big difference. Can you tell us a bit about the Big Breakfast first? Yeah, so the Big Breakfast was set up here at Above Bar about 16 years ago, as pretty much 16 years ago, and it's been running really brilliantly, and it's because of the church, it's because Above Bar backed it. But it is a ministry that serves probably 50 to 100 people every Thursday, 50 weeks a year, um, and it's essentially a place where anyone can come. It used to be for the homeless, but now it's more about people who are looking for something community. And as you know, we don't have community spaces anymore, nothing like that. But this church is absolutely amazing at what it does and, and what it brings. And the volunteers that work with Big Breakfast, and there's about 20 of them now, um, you know, it's a ministry that goes on, but it's a lot of hard work, you know, essentially starts at half seven in the morning when I bring the van up with food, and then it's all got ready for 10 o'clock, and then it's served at 11. But that ministry is amazing because it's not just the food. Um, I have one of the ministers who comes and talks as well, so it's a different type of food, so they get to hear about Jesus as well. So they're not forced to. They can come here, they can eat breakfast, they can leave. They don't have to listen about God or Jesus or anything, but they come, but actually... You'll be, you'll be surprised how many people get quite aggressive there when it's loud and they tell people to shut up when Vic's talking or one of the leaders talking. They actually shout at each other and it's quite hard to control them. And you kind of, you don't expect that. That's something you do not expect. You expect them to fight about drugs, alcohol, anything, but not about Jesus. So 
It's working. It's working. Definitely give you a good listening. If you go over five, six minutes, though, they will tell you to F off. Yeah, they do. <laughs> they, le- they do. Yeah, Vic's learned to c- keep his talks to three minutes. Great. So, and out of the big um, breakfast um, in lockdown came the big difference, and that has just grown and grown. Tell us about where you are with that. Yeah, so big difference is uh, a different uh, machine, um, a completely different machine altogether, and that literally is serving thousands of people across the city with food, so people who are suffering with food insecurity. Now, we, we... we think about food, we think about inflation, 11% down to three now. Actually, that's a load of rubbish in terms of food. Food and things like that are still way above 20%. And, the pe- and it's lovely looking at the cap stuff there because it just reminded me of, of the people. And, and th- there are thousands of people like that, stories I've got as well. And when they're telling you their stories, we're sitting here, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I've had breakfast this morning, I've eaten, my kids are all right, probably like yours. But when you hear their stories and you look at their struggles, you will be shocked at the level of poverty we have in this city. I mean, it is huge. There is no doubt about it. And people are crying. They're not, mums and dads are not eating. They are feeding their children as their priority. But when their kids can't be fed, there's a knock-on effect, there's disruption But anyway, I won't won't talk about that, but the amount of food that The Big Difference now has, um, Love Southampton did a survey back in December, and that survey showed that above bar Big big Difference now separated, but gave 62% of the food to the people that sort of did the census. Um, We're doing way more than that, I know that, because not everyone um, responded on that census, but... That shows you the level of poverty. And we work with probably over, I don't know, over 60 organizations. I've been to Costco this morning at half seven, and I've got two grand's worth of meat ready to go in the freezer. So, you know, and and meat is is something that is so expensive. I mean, I looked at the prices on there today myself and had a bit of a shock. But it's shocking that that, you know, people can't eat that, but we've got it, and we're giving it out to probably over 100 communities and schools, food banks across the city, pantry projects, 26 churches, you know, over 25 schools, huge amounts we're giving away, but we almost can't cope with the volume coming in. It's coming in hard, and I've got to balance that with what's going out. So it's it's a hard operation, but a brilliant operation. Mm. So it is hard. You're working long hours. Um, You're building this team. You've built this thing from scratch. I mean, it must take a toll on you. What, what can we pray for you as a church? How can we support you? Yeah, so I think support always comes in terms of volunteers and stuff. Financial support, people giving. I mean, one of my trustees believes in it so much that, you know, he's actually investing a substantial amount of money into it. You know, he's providing the infrastructure, all the, every, every bit of infrastructure I ask for, he's doing but he really believes in it and it's people who can and do believe in that it's it's the project to invest in and I'm not kidding I think by the end of by when I'm here next April and I haven't got to my targets as some of my trustees are in here I will get a slap around the head for not achieving my targets but I'm fairly I'm fairly confident I will achieve it it'll be sustainable by April 2025 um, so if we can pray for basically my team of volunteers, there's about 20 in Big Breakfast and probably about 30 in Big Difference. If we can pray for them, because it is those guys that actually make it work, and then pray for the core team to, to sustain it, because they're doing long hours. I think I'd sometimes do 80, 90 hours a week, but that's coming down now um, because we're putting in infrastructure. So I think it's praying for that and actually praying for the blessing of the church because it is this church who I'm very loyal to who have actually provided that infrastructure. They have, they have put in the investment. They have put in some of the money. They have put in the team. So it is this church that needs to really, you know, be thanked. They're, they're brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you. So um, our Kathy's going to pray for you. Um, if Angela 
has taken a ho- is going to take a holiday. So should you, mate. You know. Yeah, don't work too hard. Bless you. Father God, we just thank and praise you for Sanjay. We thank you for the vision that he saw, not just with the big breakfast where it started off at, but just developing the big difference. And we know there were other players involved, such as Arshad back in lockdown. And Lord, Sanjay's kind of open heart to hearing you, to receiving you in his life has been such it's such an inspiration to so many of us who've heard his story. Father God, we pray that you give encouragement to him, to all the volunteers. Um, and yeah, the trustees, Lord, give them wisdom. All those who are involved in leading um, and, and looking at trying to support and develop the big difference, Lord. The shops who supply food. We pray for the infrastructure, Lord, that that will be um, strong and robust. Um, to provide this service to so many people. And we certainly, as CAP, have referred um, clients to Big Difference and they have just been astounded by what they've been able to receive. So, Lord, we thank you that your hand is in this. We thank you that people can literally be fed. And, um, yeah, we just um, thank you uh, for Sanjay's determination and commitment continue to strengthen him, Lord, give him a joy in his heart and a determination to, to, to meet those targets by the strength of your Holy Spirit, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank Amen. you. Thank, Thank you, you brother. Much. Thank you. <clears throat> so let's just continue in prayer. Father God, we just thank and praise you for this church family. Um, I pray that no matter how we are feeling, whether we are feeling emotionally poor, um, whether we're feeling poor relationally, maybe we're feeling lonely this day, um, maybe we're not really respecting your creation, we're not respecting the environment, we don't know how to, maybe our situation, our circumstances doesn't allow us to. And we pray, of course, for those who are really hungry for food. Um, Lord, we pray that we can be a church that can not only feed people literally, but come alongside them and be friends with them, um, no matter what they think about you. Um, we, We read in the psalm, I will glory, we will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice You know, we could talk for ages about what afflicted means, but we talk about poverty in its biggest sense. And through all of the the practical help that all of the um, social action does through this church, Lord, we pray that they will taste and see that you are good. We know, Lord, that this very day and for some time, our society needs to taste and see your goodness. And we pray that each and every one of us can just do our little bit. If we are sitting here today, if we're here today going, I can't do anything, then think again, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will move throughout every single person in this church family and that that people will kind of feel that they can be a part of it somehow. Um, So yes, Lord, we pray that you break down barriers to people reaching out in whatever way they can um, to help the poor in our city and that we as a church can really understand how it is for them and come alongside them in the best way that we can and within the resources that we have. But Lord, nothing is too difficult for you. Nothing is too big. And I pray, Lord, I give you thanks for the volunteers in CAP as well, Christians Against Poverty, We have volunteers who are from our east side. We have volunteers here. And I just thank and praise you for each and every one of them. And we pray, Lord, for uh, CAP Head Office, all the work that they do. Lord, it's not easy. Um, You know, finances don't always come that easy for that big infrastructure. But Lord, if it's your will, it will be done. And we trust in you each step of the way. Um, And just thank you, Lord, for the privilege 
that it is to just come alongside people. We pray, Lord, for the clients, for each and every client whose faces I can see now that we are working closely with. Lord, we pray into the anxiety, we pray into the fear, and we pray that for those who can't take the next step, at looking at their debt, that we can help them move forward, Lord. We pray that you break down those barriers, that barrier of anxiety and fear, that they will open the letters whilst we are alongside them, helping them to do that, that they will face their fears, the reality of their situation. Lord, we just bring all of these prayers before you. And we pray, Lord, that your word, as we hear it now, Pam Bold is going to bring us our reading. We pray that your word will sink deeply into our hearts and transform our minds. In your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. The reading is from Isaiah 61, verses 1 to 3, and it's on page 749. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Thank you very much. So a couple of times a year uh, above Bar Church, um, what we try and do is um, we have a, a series where we talk about the DNA of above Bar. We reflect on what type of church are we? What is God calling us to do? What is God calling us to be? And I think the answer to that question has changed a lot uh, over the last 10 years. Throughout its history, Above Bar Church has been a large student church, the the biggest student church in the city. Um, That's changed. We're now a very diverse church as as I look out, people from all over the world, lots of nations. And we're reflecting the city far more in terms, of our, in terms of our demographic. But, you know, actually we're known now, among the other churches, as the church that's serving and reaching the poor. Well, there are many churches that are, are ahead of us in that, but it is these ministries of CAP, of the Big Breakfast, of the Big Difference, our work among asylum seekers, our work in Harefield, and even as we heard last week, um, through supporting the Jernsons in Papua New Guinea, our work in a poor tribal area. They have literally saved that tribe physically. The tribe would have died out if the Jernsons hadn't gone. They've saved it linguistically by providing written words, the Bible in Surimi language, and they've saved the tribe spiritually. The tribe is a Christian tribe. Now, we don't want to give up on anybody, and I hope that um, in your home groups, you regularly pray for and talk about what we might call your front lines, your workplace, uh, or your, where your hobbies are, your tennis club, whatever it is where you spend time with people, where you're pursuing your occupation and your hobbies. And, and I, I hope that you do focus on that and you pray for people connected to those areas. But what was Jesus' focus? You know, Luke's gospel records Jesus preaching his first sermon on Isaiah 61. So if we turn to Luke chapter 4, verses 14, uh, verses 14 to 21, we see Jesus going into the synagogue 
and the scroll of Isaiah is handed to him, and on the Sabbath day, he unrolls the scroll, verse uh, 17, and he found the place where it's written, and that's Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, he says. He's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll, and he sat down, and the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were on him, and he began by saying, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, Jesus says, this is, this is what I'm about. I am about, my, my focus is on proclaiming good news to the poor and proclaiming the year of Jubilee, which I'll talk about in a minute. So why should Above Bar Church be passionately and radically involved with the poor? Three answers. Because of the future, because of the present, and because of the past. So first of all, because of the future. So Jesus says, in, um, as Messiah, I am anointed, that's what Messiah means, anointed of God, to bring good news to the poor. And then he says to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's the year of Jubilee. That's a reference to Leviticus 25. Every 50 years in Israel, there was a law where all debts were canceled, where all slaves were freed, where land went back to its original allotments. And through that law, God was saying, I own the land, and I'm the author of whatever wealth you might accumulate, and I do not want permanent poverty in this nation. But when Jesus came, he was proclaiming the jubilee, saying, I'm going to cancel all debts. I'm going to release all prisoners. Anyone who comes to me, I'm going to forgive all their sins. He was saying that he was bringing the, the power of the future kingdom where there is no debt, where there is no slavery, where poverty has been made history. He was bringing the power of the future into the present. That's what it means to proclaim the kingdom. The kingdom is a foretaste of the future. In, this, in the future, in the physical world that we're going to live in, in the future, all injustice will be erased. All poverty, all death, all mourning, all addiction, all violence, gone. What are the implications of this? If Jesus is going to end poverty and death and sickness, well, then, well, that should be reflected in his followers now. That means that where we can, we should be seeking to heal the sick, to relieve poverty, to help people out of debt, to reach poor, forgotten tribal peoples where we can, to assist refugees and asylum seekers where we can, to understand something about autism where we can, those that are oppressed and poor and outcasts. This is Christian thinking. You know, and until Jesus, most people felt that the poor and the downtrodden and the slaves were born that way and they should stay that way because there was a class that were born to be subjected and there was a class that were born to rule. That was what Aristotle said. Look at this uh, quote from Aristotle. For that some should rule and others should be ruled is a thing not only necessary but expedient. From the hour of their birth, some are marked out for subjection and others for rule. We lived in a Buddhist country for five years and it's very much that. This, this is karma. Your lot in life that is given to you now is the result of how you've lived in previous lives. Where did the idea of public hospitals come from? Well, it came from Christianity, from the Byzantines, inspired by the gospel, inspired by Jesus' preaching and proclaiming of the kingdom of God. Because of the future kingdom to come, Christians looked after the poor 
and the infirm, and it was completely countercultural. And people noticed it and remarked on it, and some scorned it, but many embraced it. So we care for the poor because of the future kingdom that is coming. Secondly, we care for the poor because of the present. Sanjay referenced the fact that we are living in a cost of living crisis. If you have a family, particularly, unless you have wealthy parents that can help you or a very high income job, it's a struggle to pay the bills, isn't it? We can't pay the bills. We get our family and our friends. We write a prayer letter. We spend a thousand pound a month more than we earn. Um, and that's us. And we are so privileged to have wealthy uh, family. But this is, this is why so many, not just the downtrodden poor, but so many are dependent on food banks. And when the fixed mortgage rate ends in a few months, it's going to be even harder, isn't it, for so many? So again, I, I feel that Above Bar Church has moved, uh, uh, sorry, God has moved Above Bar Church to lean in to the plight of the poor. But as Kathy was talking about, the poor is a big category. When Jesus focused his ministry on the poor, what does that mean? Well, we see him cleansing lepers. We see him healing the blind. We see him touching women who had bodily issues that made them unclean. We see him receiving and embracing children. We see him eating and drinking with outcasts, with prostitutes, with sinners. And perhaps the word outcast is a better translation of the word poor. Jesus, in Luke chapter 6, on the Sermon on, in, on the Plain, he looks at his disciples and he says, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. What, what does he mean? He's not saying, blessed are you if you draw benefits and you don't try and better yourself. What does he mean? He means that even, well, do you know, folks, do you know that even your best deeds have bad motives? Do you know that? Do you, do you know that you are spiritually bankrupt without without God moving in your life? Do you believe that your only hope in life and death is the free generosity of God? Do you know that? Then you are spiritually poor. This is how you come into the kingdom. Jesus says the only way to come to God is to be poor in spirit. Only the spiritually poor can receive salvation. But it's often those who are materially poor that know that they're spiritually poor and know their need and are able to receive the gift of salvation. But if you come like this, then it should change the way that you look at the poor for the rest of your life. If you truly are spiritually poor, you will love the materially poor. You'll realize to some extent that you're looking in the mirror because you realize in the words of John, who wrote Revelation, that you're wretched and poor and blind and naked yourself, spiritually, you'll want to help the poor. And, you know, as Sanjay was talking, I was thinking about our own very, uh, our very own Vic Jacobson, I saw here this morning. Vic's still speaking at the big breakfast. I think of his, his story growing up in an orphanage, uh, a petty thief being in prison, and being saved. And till the very end of his life, wanting to share good news with the poor, with those guys that, that look and smell wretched sometimes, because you know, he knows that's his story. And that's our story too. Are there any here who feel like you've lived a pretty good life, actually? And because of your good deeds, God owes you eternal life. Is there anyone here like that? That's not being poor in spirit. You know what that is? That's being middle class in spirit. And being middle class in spirit is pretty deadly, isn't it? The way to avoid that spirit is to look back at what Jesus has done for us. So we care for the poor because of the 
future and because of the present, but also because of the past. I want to just get uh, Isaiah 61 verse 3 on the screen and look at this verse. The verse that stood out to me was the verse, was the, sorry, the word that stood out was the word instead. There are five servant songs in Isaiah. Isaiah was actually prophesying hundreds of years before Jesus. But what we see is he speaks very explicitly of Jesus and the substitution that Jesus brings. And all of the servant songs are like this. He did this for me. He did this for us. And this word instead, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. What we see there is substitution and reversal. And that's a key theme in Isaiah, but also Luke. Jesus has come to bring the great reversal. He's, bring, he's come to bring the upside down kingdom. And he achieves this through his death on the cross and his resurrection because the cross is the epitome of the upside down kingdom where the exalted king of heaven becomes a poor naked criminal who literally needs to be peeled off a cursed wooden cross. And lots of people hate that about the gospel. Nietzsche, who was a philosopher, he hated that about the gospel. He said this, what is more harmful than any vice? Practical sympathy for the botched and the weak. Christianity. He hated Christianity. But it's because of the cross that Jesus receives the thorns and the ashes, and we receive the crown of beauty. It's because of the cross that Jesus mourns more than any man ever mourned, and we can receive the oil of joy. It is because of the cross that Jesus takes on the despair, actually crying out, Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that we can receive the garment of praise. He became the ultimate outcast so that we can be, come, oaks of righteousness. Paul writes this, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Jesus loved this world so much that he became poor and naked, despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, a victim of injustice, in order to give us the riches of adoption. So folks, we care for the poor because of the future, the kingdom that is coming, where there's no disease, no poverty, no debt, no slavery, and because of the future, we go after it now. And we care because of the present, because we're living in a time of mass migration and great physical and emotional and spiritual need. And we do it because of the past, because Christ died for us, the rich for the poor, to make the poor rich. And I think when this gospel of grace is really connected to the poor, it pushes a button in us if we're sensitive to the Spirit. We want to help. We want to pray. We want to give. We want to go. And in terms of our DNA, God is calling us to be this kind of church. Where that will take us, I don't know, but this kind of church that is radically committed to justice and mercy and to bringing good news to the poor, good news to everyone, but especially good news to the poor. Thanks, Chris. It's always great to hear you teach on the word. Um, yeah, just a really, really quickly, um, just about the CAP um, kind of vision and about how anyone can help. I don't know if you have the slide there with the bullet points about, um, if you don't, don't worry. Thank you. Okay, so just we do have a vision to grow the, the CAP team to make it more robust. You know, Sanjay will be around, I'm sure, at the end of the service to talk about if any one of you feels 
you want to talk, find out more about Big Breakfast, Big Difference, you know, please talk to Sanjay. If any of you want to find out more about CAP, please come and talk with us. We're, we've got a table set up out in the lounge. Um, we're going to be hanging around there. Um, and we really want to kind of, we're looking to, you know, try and get a deck coach alongside me so that we can grow the team in a more robust way. Community links coordinator, these are just some of the things that you might want to find out more about. I don't have the job descriptions on me, sorry, but we, I can take your details and we can talk more about it. And obviously, if you want to volunteer, that's great. Um, and we can talk about that. And then, next slide, I think there might be a little bit, yeah. And if you want to partner with CAP, and don't think you can do any of those front-facing kind of uh, support roles, please pray. <laughs> uh, please pray. We do have a prayer letter each month. What month is it? April. Still April, isn't it? Um, I do a prayer letter, um, very simple, um, just praying for our clients and praying for the team. If you don't receive that and want to receive that again, come and see me. You can commit financially. CAP, as an organisation, will say, please, you know, if you're not giving to your church, please give to your church first. But if you feel that you can commit financially to CAP, then again, please, that would be amazing, um, just to help with the bigger infrastructure of that. Um, and I've spoken about the prayer letter. So, And this is a picture that a couple of our volunteers did so that when a client becomes debt free we're going to add butterflies and it's just marking a celebration um, of that and we've got to add a few on here because this is quite new so we've got to add a few so because you know we've had at least two become debt free since the centre reopened with another two or three possibly very soon um, and there was something else I was going to say and I can't remember it now so it's gone out of my head but never mind so um um, yes, we had, sorry, really important, we did have a CAP client give her life to Christ in February at a ladies' spiritual health weekend that we try and encourage um, CAP clients to come to, So, and that was quite powerful. So um, she's sorry she couldn't be here today. She's broken a leg. So thank you, everybody, um, and I'll be back in a second. Thanks. I would ask you to, to bear with me here. I'm going off piece. This is not something we do uh, particularly often, but uh, as, as I've been listening to everything sat in the front here, I just feel really excited about this gospel opportunity. Um, this is not polished. Um, I'm going to try and be real with you here rather than be polished. You know, it's, it's clean and tidy in the graveyard, but it's, um, it's crazy and fun in the crash. So I'm going to hope this is a little bit <laughs> like the crash. Uh, I, I sense that God is placing a burden on above our church, um, for the poor. I think Chris has shared powerfully about the mandate in the gospel for us to care for the poor. I really felt that burden this morning, and it might just be me, but I wonder whether that's true for other people as well. Um, and I think we should take a moment to press into that, to mark this as a church, to let God continue to speak into that area. So I'd like to do something that doesn't come very naturally for us, um, but if you think that's you if, you, if you've really felt that burden for the poor this morning, I'd love to invite you to come down the front here, We'd like to partner with you in that. We'd like to pray for you in that. Um, if you think that's something that God is speaking to you about, let's take a step to press into that further. Um, this isn't a prepared thing, so I don't actually have anyone to pray with you. Um, so I'd also encourage you, um, church family, um, home group leaders, ministry leaders, members of the prayer team, that as people come down to the front, why don't you come and join them and pray for them and ask God to speak into their life. Um, a really practical thing for that is let's do men with men and women with women. Um, that just helps safeguard all of this. We're, do we're doing all of this within a series about being God-dependent. Well, maybe this is what being God-dependent looks like. Um, whilst we're going to do that, we're going to sing again. So uh, if you think that's you, um, if you really felt that burden, I'd encourage you to make your way down as we stand to worship. Um, and if you see someone down here, um, why don't you come and pray with them, partner with them, and let's see what God is doing here. I invite you to stand with us. Maybe now is your opportunity to come down to the front. Um, 
I would be there, but I'm here. And let's sing.
Friend here has just asked to share something for one minute. Good morning. Those who don't know, my name's Mark, and I've been working in Vietnam for the last eight years with YWAM and Scripture Union. Um, I have seen poverty at first hand in Vietnam for the last eight years. Um, children starving. Parents abandoning their children because they can't afford them. They actually leave them at the orphanage on their doorstep. Is a big problem in Asia. And parents just cannot afford to look after their children. And if they can't afford to look after them, they just abandon them on the street. It's, it's a massive problem. Poverty just doesn't affect here, it affects the world. What can we do to, to change that situation? Is to pray is to work what work what's going here, to try and change lives and to try and change the world we're in. As far as I'm concerned, poverty shouldn't exist. Poverty shouldn't be here. But unfortunately it is. And as a church and as a Christian community, we should work together, pray together, work together and to save lives and to bring people to Christ. And as a church, we have a responsibility to, to witness to these people, but also to help them through their time of need and time of trouble. If it's just to be there, just to pray for them, to put your arm around them, to pray for them, that makes a big difference to them. So I do urge all of you, please, take up this challenge and do something to change the world and to change poverty. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. We've come to the end of our service. If anybody um, wants to receive prayer, pre please come up to the front. We have the prayer team who will be only too happy and willing to pray with any of you. There is, remember, there is no nothing that's too small or too big that we can't bring to the Lord. He's interested in every part of our lives. So thank you for being here today. Have a blessed week. God bless.